and I'll go ahead. Give people a few minutes to come in. Yes, but I have to admit them, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So, um, and let's make sure that we've muted everyone as well. Um, could everybody mute their uh, microphones before I start so that we can make sure that there's no background noise. If you have your microphone on, uh, let's make sure you're muted and welcome. Let's see, here we go, admit all. Lots and lots of people are still coming in. Okay, so Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at the Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about the many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. And before I turn it over to Irene, I just wanted to let everyone know that we're going to be recording tonight's session, as we always do, but we're planning on uh, making this available on YouTube. So I, I just wanted to let everybody know this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and allow Irene, turn it over to Irene to introduce our amazing speaker, Mark Anthony. Hi everybody, it's nice to see everyone tonight. And also, uh, don't forget, please put your questions for Mark in the chat box and Elizabeth will be checking them and reading questions as we go along. Uh, Mark Anthony is our special guest speaker tonight. Mark was going to be a keynote presenter at the conference, which would have been starting tomorrow in Charleston. Um, we know he will be speaking when we do have a date and venue for the conference. Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, is the author of the spiritual bestsellers, Evidence of Eternity and Never Letting Go. Mark Anthony's credentials and experience are unparalleled in the paranormal world. He is an Oxford educated trial attorney, licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington DC, and before the United States Supreme Court. In England, he studied mediumship at the prestigious Arthur Finley College for the Advancement of Psychic Science. Dr. Gary Schwartz, Professor of Psychology, Medicine, Neurology, Psychiatry, and Surgery at the University of Arizona and Director of the Laboratory for Advances in Consciousness and Health has ranked Mark as one of the top mediums in the United States. For more information about Mark Anthony, his books, tour schedule, personal readings, kindly visit his website, www.evidenceofeternity.com. I wanted to just uh, briefly share my personal experience with Mark. I had a reading relatively early in my journey with grief. My daughter passed on a Sunday and Sundays were extremely difficult for me. One of the amazing validations um, that happened during my reading, Mark stated that your daughter is saying, heaven is better than a Sunday. Wow, that just made an incredible difference in my journey. So um, welcome, Mark, and uh, we look forward to hearing you speak to all of us tonight. Thank you so much, Irene, and thank you, Elizabeth and Jason and everybody connected with Helping Parents Heal. It's such an honor to be here tonight, and I'm sorry that uh, we couldn't all be in Charleston 
this week. And if you haven't been to Charleston, it's really a treat. It's such a, a beautiful city. And uh, thanks to the miracle of modern technology, here we all are. So thank you everybody for having me. Um, you know, I, Irene, I wanna to touch upon uh, that reading. Um, that was a very, very profound reading for me as well, because what, what the message that your daughter Carly gave with heaven is better than a Sunday, you know, she passed on a Sunday that you told me after the reading and how every Sunday had become a very painful reminder. And we do this. Um, you know, my, my dad died on a Saturday, my mom died on a Thursday, you know, and for, for a good deal of time, every time a Thursday or a Saturday came by, it hit very hard. But of course, the death of a child being the most profound pain beyond imagining. But then when she said, heaven is better than a Sunday, I remember us talking about it. And you said, you know, that's Carly's way of letting me know that when I wake up on Sunday, instead of being miserable and sad, I should be happy that she is in heaven. And that's better than any Sunday, Sunday. better than anything that, that could be here in this world. And that, that was so profound. And thank you for, for sharing that with us. Thank you. So a lot of people ask me about the work that I do. And, you know, the, the question that always comes up is the psychic lawyer. How did that happen? <laughs> and I, I mean, it, I always get a, a big kick out of that because um, I, was, I was born into a family of psychic mediums. And um, Elizabeth um, asked me about my near-death experience, which happened when I was four years old. And I actually want to get into that in greater detail when I do speak at the conference. But a number of people have asked me, they said, well, well what gives you the right to talk to parents who've lost a child? And certainly, you know, I, I have not, not suffered the loss of a child. I have suffered the losses of, of many people, uh, my parents, my, my two best friends that I've known since childhood, uh, my godfather, my godmother. I mean, it's just the list goes on and on. But I remember my parents telling me that when I was born, I wasn't breathing. I was a, what they call a blue baby. And the doctor told my mother that they said, we, you know, they said we're very sorry. And my mom said, you work on him. And, and they, they tried and they tried. And I think they're doing it more to placate her than anything else. And all of a sudden they heard me cough and I came back. And then when I was four years old, I was very, very ill and I went into respiratory failure and then cardiac arrest. And that's when I had my near death experience and, and that I, I left this world and I went into a completely different realm. So by the time I was, I was five, I'd almost died twice. And then I had parents who could see spirits. So when I was about Right before my NDE, I started talking about all my invisible friends, which is not unusual for a little kid, except for the fact that my parents could see these people too. And I remember my, my mother was like, oh, he's got it. And then my dad was like, oh, he's got it. And my father was very concerned because people in, in that time, they looked at this as, as a taboo or that, that you're somehow mentally ill. And as I got older, I realized that not everybody's parents and not everybody's family was like mine, but we always knew that an afterlife exists. And even though I've gone through my, my uh, struggle with faith throughout my life, the one thing I've always known is that something beyond this material world does exist. So I, I just you know, wanted to, to let you know that. So, no questions? All right, then I'll keep going. So, um, there is a question I, that has to do with Sunday. Let me, let me just read. Um, this comes from Sunday Haas, and she says, um, I love that heaven is better than a Sunday. My name is Sunday, and my beautiful girl also died on a Sunday. Question is, how do we know if our kids are healthy or still struggling in a healing center type place? Um, That's a beautiful, beautiful question. And I've conducted over 15,000 readings in my life. So I've, I've done readings for 
15,000 people. And in each reading, generally more than one person comes through. So let's say the average is about five or six people. So, you know, we're talking, I've communicated with close to 100,000 spirits in my life. And I've yet to find one that said, oh, boo-hoo, I'm miserable. And I, and I don't say that lightly. We tend to judge the, the uh, eternity of the collective consciousness, which is the other side, on the basis of what we know. And that's a very human thing to do, is to classify things on the basis of what we're familiar with. But the truth of the matter is, think of your soul as a drop of water, and that when your body dies, that drop of water leaves the brain, which hosts the soul and your consciousness. And I use the two terms, soul, or the terms soul, spirit, and consciousness interchangeably. And then your soul plunges into an eternal sea of consciousness, which is the other side. And so spirits being pure energy, and we know from the laws of physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. And energy never gets sick and never gets Oh dear. There we go. How's that? Sorry. It's okay. my fault. <laughs> Sorry about that. Back to the classroom. No. <laughs> That's all right. All right. So where did where did I get cut off? Okay, let me let me keep going. So spirits are pure energy, and energy never gets sick, it never gets old, it never dies. And spirits are never unhappy. We're the ones that are unhappy and, and miserable. So take comfort in that when you leave the material world, what dies with the body is the emotional, physical pain, um, the discomfort, the, uh, if there's mental issues or physical issues, all of those are things of the physical which stay here in the material world. But who and what we are is an energetic spirit, an immortal living being that transcends this and goes to another frequency. But that being said, that doesn't make the, the pain of loss any easier. We miss their physical presence. And one of the things that I try to teach um, Irene and Elizabeth and, and Sunday is that we, we will never get over the fact that a loved one has died. And what we miss is the physical presence. You know, you want to hug your child, uh, hug and kiss them and, and uh, just be there with them. But our relationship with that person doesn't end. It transforms from one of a physical nature to one of a spiritual nature. Because once again, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's only transferred from one form to another. And I bet everybody in this, in this uh, Zoom meeting today has felt the presence of their child. Um, is there any way we can do like a show of hands in the chat room? How many people here ha have either had a dream or felt they saw something out of their peripheral vision or just heard a voice? See, everybody, everybody's chiming in. And what happens is, a lot of times uh, therapists and skeptics will say, well, that's a grief induced hallucination or wishful thinking, and it isn't. And I go into this in both of my books in Never Letting Go. Um, I explain how to recognize when loved ones and spirit are near. And then in Evidence of Eternity, I go uh, even further explaining how this works on the basis of frequency and quantum physics. And what happens is, Everything in the universe is energetically interconnected. And, and please bear with me on the, the quantum physics lecture. But okay, everybody here in school, we all learned that things were made of molecules, right? Show of hands, everybody that heard that. Okay, all right. I mean, that's like fourth grade science, fifth grade science. And now we know that not only are molecules made of atoms, but atoms are made of smaller particles known as electrons, protons, and neutrons. And now we know that they are made of a even smaller particle known as quanta. And that's where the term quantum physics comes from. And quanta is electromagnetic energy. And everything is electromagnetic energy. And I mean, the, the cells in your blood, the sunlight, the sun itself, the ocean water, the air that we breathe, everything in creation is electromagnetic energy. And as Albert Einstein said, there's no matter, there's merely energy which vibrates at different frequencies. So when someone we love dies, they don't cease to exist. 
their energy is merely transferred to another form vibrating at a higher frequency. And because their energy, everything and everyone that, that everyone that we know, both on this side of existence and on the other side, are energetically interconnected. So when you're grieving and you're, you're in that, that horrible pain, that caving in sensation, the uncontrollable um, uh, crying, or just sometimes when you just feel downright lousy and you're missing somebody, we're emitting these waves of frequency. And think of it as like a, a spider web. And you know, like if a fly hits a spider web, it sends a vibration along the web. Well, your grieving sends a vibration. Your loved one, your child picks, it, picks up on that and that will draw them to you. Or they will send a vibration along the frequency and make you turn on the radio just as that song that, that makes you think of him or her comes on. Or maybe when you're dreaming, and, and I can get into this in a little bit more, but there are whole... Um, a whole set of ways that spirits will get their message through to you one way or another. And so when you have those experiences that you feel, hear, or smell something associated with your child, or you have that dream, realize that these are contact experiences and don't let anyone persuade you otherwise. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. So there's another question here that um, was just asked, and I think that it's a great one. Um, Mark, what evidence do we have, or do you have, um, that we as a family planned our lives to be like this? Um, that we would agree to have our child leave before us, that they would volunteer for such a thing, and we as parents would too. It seems impossible to believe what do you think? This is Lisa asking that question. You know, Lisa, that's, that question gets asked so many times, and I don't know if there really is, is a good answer for it, because, I mean, like, like you just said, what parent would volunteer before you come into this world to suffer that type of pain? What loving child will want to inflict that upon his or her parents and, and siblings and, and uh, friends and relatives? But then again, we're also looking at everything from a finite perspective. And spirits are infinite. Uh, so basically, once again, we're that drop of water. And the drop of water is trying to understand the Pacific Ocean. So there may be reasons that in our limited finite perception, we can't possibly comprehend. It appears based on the thousands of readings that I've done though, that everything that we do here in the material world is for a reason. And it appears that we come from the other side in a state of essentially bliss where you know, being pure energy and, and you don't age or get sick or, or have any type of, of um, of depression or sadness, that we come into the material world so that we can experience things that we cannot on the other side. And people say, well, what sense is there when a baby dies? What sense is there? And then it's the proverbial pebble that falls into the pond and sets forth the concentric circles. And those concentric circles touch other concentric circles and touch more and more. And so it becomes this vast ripple effect. And I mean, think about this organization, Helping Parents Heal. This is a very powerful organization. This is a group that helps people that are in the very pit of misery, but would it have come into existence were it not for the death of a child? And I am not for one, one nanosecond downplaying or marginalizing the, the, the pain and agony that, that a parent goes through. But when one door closes, another door opens. And so based on, on uh, the thousands of readings I've done and the connections that I've been involved with, it appears that everything actually does have a reason. But we may not always understand that reason, particularly while we're living in the material world. Thank you, Mark. I have another question here, Mark, from Anne. 
Um, our son has been gone three and a half years. Lately, I have not felt his presence, and I don't know if that's because I am not tuned in or if he is, just isn't there. Do you feel for sure that we will see our loved ones when we pass on? Absolutely, and, here, and here's why I know that. As I indicated earlier, my mother was a medium, and she and I were very close. And, and um, it was a trip because mom would call me up and she'd say, hey, honey, this would be like on a Saturday. You know, uh, I was practicing a lot, but she, she'd call me up and on a Saturday go, I got to go to the mall to, to pick something up. Do you want to go with me? Well, that was code for, are you going to spend the day with me? All right. So I'd, I'd go. And it'd be funny because, you know, she wasn't just going to spend 15 minutes at the mall. Please. My mom used to be a fashion designer. Right. This meant like eight stores and lunch. OK, so it was a whole day thing. And uh, we'd sit there and, and we'd look at people's auras sometimes. We, you know, we wouldn't get too invasive, but she'd go, look at the aura on that one. And that was what was cool about having a, a mom that was a medium. And I remember the day before she passed, I, I was at my office, my law office. And uh, the beauty is I only lived a couple miles from, from my parents. And I had this craving for spaghetti. And so I picked up the phone and I called mom and she said, hey, honey, I just made spaghetti. Why don't you come over for lunch? So I thought, all right. And it was, it was really sweet. I mean, we sat there and we talked, we laughed. Mom looked tired that day and I was a little bit concerned. And on the way out, she said, I want to thank you for being my son. And I was like, well, that's really sweet. She goes, Mark, I really love you. And she hugged me and kissed me. And, and, you know, and, and I said, I love you too, mom. And then the next day I was in court and the judge's assistant came out and said, Mark, we need to see you right now in chambers. And I knew something really bad had happened. And when I went into chambers and they gave me the phone, um, it was my secretary, she was in tears. And she said, we just got a call from your dad that your mom passed. And I mean, it was, it was a, a, a shock wave. And, but I knew I knew that that her soul had gone to the other side, but it still it hurt really badly. And about a week later, I was driving in my car and all of a sudden I just knew I had to pull over. So I pulled over into a parking lot and this flash of light went off in my head and it was like coming from the passenger seat. And I looked over and I saw the silhouette of my mom, but in a silver white light. And this voice came to me and it said, Mark, you have been given the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief, but now you must help those who are suffering with theirs. And you must teach people that God exists, heaven exists, our soul is an immortal living spirit. We can communicate with those souls and we will be reunited with them when it is our time to enter the light. And I mean, it's like, and it hit me like a thunderbolt. Wow. Talk about... Talk about uh, a, a, a transformative experience. And at that point, I knew that my life would never be the same. And within a year, I had left the practice of law and had to pursue this avocation of helping people understand those five messages. So without a doubt, I know that God exists, heaven exists, our souls and immortal living spirit, we can and do communicate with those souls and that we will be reunited with them when it is our time to leave the material world. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mark. And Rebecca is asking, how can your child's consciousness be contained in spirit as opposed to dispersed, similar to our shell body? Uh, that contains our consciousness and energy. Well, exactly, because the, um, the soul, the consciousness, the spirit, is an electromagnetic energy field, and it's coherent. And it stays coherent after physical death. And the reason that we know that is, uh, once again, going to quantum physics. But in the last 40 years, survival of consciousness studies, and I, I have to give credit to my friend and colleague, Dr. Raymond Moody, for starting survival of consciousness studies and coining the phrase near-death experiences. And since then, and, and it's been a real honor being on this journey because I've gotten to know Dr. Raymond Moody, Dr. Kenneth Ring, Dr. Bruce Grayson, um, Dr. Gary Schwartz, uh, Dr. Evan Alexander, um, 
I mean, all of these, you know, uh, these incredible scientists who've been studying survival of consciousness. And in near-death experiences, people, um, they're, they're conducted all over the world, and there's like 10, 10 similarities. And it doesn't matter what faith you are or whether or not you even believe in God, your ethnicity, socioeconomic status, it doesn't matter, I mean, and anything, whether drugs were involved or, or not. And the conclusion of all of these scientific studies, and, and what's really cool is my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Long, he founded the ENDERF, the Near Death Experience Research Foundation. And ENDERF, what it does is it's a database from all over the world. And we're talking NDEs, near death experiences, the similarities in the United States, Holland, Iran, China, Pakistan, Australia, I mean, you can name every country are the same. And, and it's fascinating because the Iranian doctors, you know, they got to be kind of, you know, careful about, about what they do um, because, you know, Islam um, and, and certain, you know, certain religions um, are not necessarily receptive to, to the concept of an NDE. But the thing is, the Iranian doctors are finding the same conclusions that European doctors Chinese doctors who are, you know, tend to be atheists, uh, as um, doctors in in more uh, faith-oriented countries in, you know, Europe, the North and South America. So we now have a scientific uh, field, a discipline where we've taken the scientific method of objective observation and going into a situation without preconceived notions and compiling the data. And the data is amazing, and it's amazingly, um, it, 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 it's, it's all the same from all over the world. So I know I, know I get excited about this, but this is uh, one of my passions, is that we now have scientific proof that consciousness not only survives physical death, but stays coherent. So your child did not just disperse into some you know, electrical arc and snap and pop, but your child is a coherent spiritual entity. That's wonderful. And I love that explanation. And I love the fact that this research is being do done in so many different places all over the world. Um, Susan is asking, do you believe that suicides are also planned? If not, how does their leaving change the life plans of those who are left behind? Suicide is an extremely complex behavior, and I go into it quite extensively in, in my book, Evidence of Eternity. Think about the people in the Twin Towers on 9-11. I'll never forget seeing on TV people jumping out of the Twin Towers, and, and we were horrified. Um, and then it dawned on me, they had a choice to jump to their death, which, you know, I'm sure nobody wanted to do, or be burned alive. And that's, that's not, not a very pleasant choice. And that's the thing about suicide, is the people who die from suicide, we now know that psychologically, their reality is so hellish from their unique perspective, that there is no escape from it other than the cessation of consciousness, in other words, dying by suicide. And it's very difficult for those of us who are not in that, that incredibly depressed um, or are not in the suicidal mindset. And it's very easy to be judgmental about it. Um, and even all the religions, you know, say things like, you know, you're going to go to hell if you do this. Even the normally tolerant Buddhists say that this is bad karma and, you know, you'll get reincarnated as something bad. I think the religions need to get a pass there. They're well-intentioned, but inflicting the guilt and the shame is really unnecessary. Um, we're all the children of God or the divine power that you want to call God. And you as parents would never condemn your child, no matter what he or she did, to an eternity of suffering. So God doesn't either. The reason that religions come down so heavily upon suicide is because it affects us all and it, it hurts all of us. So what they want to do is try to create a mindset to help people avoid resorting to that. 
does it affect one's life plan or is it part of one's life plan? And once again, that's those of us who have this finite, limited material world perception. And what I mean by that is that we think that everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And why wouldn't we? We're born, we grow old, or we grow to a certain age, and then we die. And we tend to think of everything as a timeline, you know, like, like how we read. It starts at a point and then travels to, uh, from, from left to right, and then, then that's the end. But it isn't like that. The other side is, is timeless, and that, that's, that's an entirely another discussion about space-time. But we have a very, very limited and finite perception. And so we're trying to understand something much vaster than ourselves. And perhaps when somebody dies from suicide and the pain and the, uh, the, the lessons and the, the karma, if you will, that inflicts on other people and how they respond to it, it sets in motion several different chains of, of reaction. But I don't think there's any easy or simplistic answer. Suicide affects all of us. My very best friend uh, died from suicide. Um, one of my cousins died from suicide. I, I can't think of anyone I know who hasn't in some way been touched by suicide. It's, it's a very, very painful behavior and it's important for us not to sit in judgment of the person saying that they're weak or, or they were screwed up or, or whatever because we have to struggle to understand why was that person so encased in what he or she perceived to be a hellish reality that they felt that there was no other way out. And, and um, I think that's where our focus needs to be than, than trying to sit in judgment. So I, I hope that answers your question. That's beautiful. I was just going to add to that and I wondered what your thoughts are. <clears throat> that I've often heard that it's the oldest souls who come back to um, and, and decide before they come back that they may be completing suicide to help others uh, to be able to move forward with some kind of life lesson that's important. I don't know if that's true, but um, it's, it's something that I've heard from different people that I've read. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I do. Um... See, I, I differ from a lot of my colleagues in the metaphysical realm. I don't necessarily believe in old souls or young souls. What I believe is the number of lifetimes that a person has and their experiences tied into their, their lifetimes. <laughs> um, I do believe in reincarnation um, because in, in near-death experiences, everyone that comes back from an NDE believes in reincarnation. And, and think about it, the idea of going to a fiery pit for all of eternity, I mean, that's, you know, uh, that to me, and uh, forgive me if I'm offending anyone, that's mythological nonsense, um, once again, created to impose fear upon people, because energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. Um, but the difference between what you would call an old soul and a new soul is maybe an old soul has had more experiences in this material world than another soul that's energy has transferred in from another dimension. Because returning again to quantum physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. And when it comes to reincarnation, I was in LA and there was uh, somebody there and, and she had a PhD and she was like, oh, well, there's more people alive now than have ever existed before in human history. So how could there possibly be reincarnation? And, and I'm so aware of that argument. And I said, well, that's assuming with your question that earth is a closed system as, as opposed to a dimension where energy is flowing in and flowing out. So there's a whole steady stream of new arrivals from you know, wherever it is, uh, another dimension. And she said, wow, I never really thought of it that way. And I said, of course. And so you go through a number of incarnations here, and then we go somewhere, you know, to another dimension. I know we're getting a little bit off topic there. Um, and I know a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to believe in reincarnation because if I try to, you know, communicate with a medium and, and my, my child is reincarnated, they won't be there. And it's like, it's not that simple because we're multidimensional beings. And so our higher self, if, if I may for a moment, think of your higher, the higher aspect of your soul as a librarian. 
and the librarian has read the books, you know, The Diary of Anne Frank, War and Peace, The Godfather, um, you know, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. And let's say you want to talk to Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, but your loved one has been reincarnated as Michael Corleone from The Godfather. Well, the librarian has read all the books and, and knows all the characters, but the characters don't know each other. So when you engage in spirit communication with a spirit that is technically reincarnated and you um, communicate with the higher self, the higher self um, is the repository of those memories from other lifetimes and is able to communicate with you by bringing forth those personality traits. So it's not, you know, so simple as we might think. It's, it's actually much more complex. And that's why don't worry if your loved one's reincarnated because not only will you see them, but because there's no time in the way that we know it, you can live another 50 or 60 years, but in the spirit's reckoning, you'll be along any second now. So uh, I hope that, I hope that clarifies, clarifies that. That's wonderful news. And I think that it's always a good thing for parents to hear that um, if their kids were to reincarnate, we're gonna still be with them when we get over there. Um, absolutely, absolutely. There's, there's a question from Shannon. What are your thoughts on spirits? I guess this is a good one for, a, for an attorney on spirits and getting justice for them. Oh, justice. Well, the universe is one of balance. So there may be no hell, but there sure is karma and there sure is reincarnation. And um, I write about that quite a bit in Evidence of Eternity. And the book that I just finished writing, um, I go into that even further. Um, as an attorney, I can say, uh, and with um, all due respect to my colleagues in the legal profession, our system is flawed. It's largely a failure and it is a criminal justice system. It seems like the criminals have all the rights and the victims don't necessarily. And I can say that because I've been a prosecutor, I've been a criminal offense attorney, and I've been a victim rights advocate. And I've seen how, you know, the focus is on, oh, we can't offend this person, although, you know, the, the evidence is, is very clear that they, they did this. So even if our human system of justice fails, don't think that person's going to be let off the hook. There's a much larger uh, balance in the universe. Uh, and it's a lot more simple than, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's more of a ripple effect. Um, once again, I could, I could probably spend a couple hours just talking about that. But the thing is, we, um, we've all had situations where um, perhaps, you know, you're, you're all right, well, here, here's a good one. Here's a good one. I was doing a read, reading for this woman, and her son had been, had been brutally murdered. Okay, his, uh, it's, it's a long story, but basically his... Um, ex-girlfriend who had a major drug problem, wanted to get back at him. And so she and these two guys broke into his apartment and started roughing him up when he was sleeping. And the guy hit back uh, really hard at, uh, at one of the assailants who pulled a gun and shot him. And he ran out the door and they chased him out into the street and they, you know, they shot him and, and he died. And the, the trial, it took years to get to, to, to the trial and it still hadn't happened. Well, she contacted me, it was actually a telephone reading. And so I was doing a reading for her and all of a sudden, I mean, her son had come through and then all of a sudden I go, there's another woman over there with him and she keeps saying her name is Lizzie and she's holding an ax. And I go, this is really weird. And the client goes, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And I go, why? She said, well, I was doing some genealogy about a month ago and I found out that I'm a direct descendant of Lizzie Borden. I go, Lizzie Borden, like the ax murderess from the 19th century? And she goes, yeah. And so in this vision of Lizzie Borden, she walks over to a jack-o'-lantern and starts hacking it to bits and looks at me and said, justice will be done. All right, I'm like, okay, hold on a second here. So I got Lizzie Borden in this vision chopping apart a, a jack-o'-lantern. So that must indicate something significant connected to you or possibly your son right around Halloween. And my client says, oh my gosh, she said that my son's murderer, the guy that pulled the trigger, jury selection in his trial starts on October 31st, Halloween. Okay, 
And I'm like, you're kidding me. She goes, no, she goes, this is really wild, you know? And, and I said, okay. And, and so uh, that, that was the message, justice will be done. Well, I waited until about a month after Halloween and I called my client and she answered the phone and I said, okay, so what happened? She goes, yes, jury selection started October 31st. The trial lasted almost three weeks and he was convicted on all counts of premeditated first degree murder. And he's, and he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. And she goes, I know this sounds terrible. She goes, I'm a Christian, but somehow that message from Lizzie Borden made me feel better. And I said, you know, there's a first time for everything. And I've never had the spirit of a homicidal maniac come through and bring someone a happy message. So, so I guess there is justice and no matter what, you're not going to escape it on this side or the other side. Oh my goodness gracious, I love that. Um, I, I have something from Blossom at, saying that she loves that you re can read people's auras. Does our aura change when we are grieving? Oh, absolutely. Our, our aura changes constantly because it's an energetic field. Look at a light bulb. See the glow around it? Everybody see the glow? Okay. Guess what? That's the light bulb's aura. Why? Because the light bulb, once it's lit up, there's electricity, which is energy flowing through it. And the glow around the source of the energy is the aura. Well, guess what? We have an energy field. Our nervous system, our heart, our brain runs on electrical impulses. So when you pick up on someone's aura, you're seeing the glow of energy around them and it will shift in both size. To, you know, if it's real diffuse and, and kind of fluttery, that can mean somebody's in an agitated or confused state. If it's real tight around a person, that can mean they're very focused and concise. And then the colors that, that are emitted in it can also indicate a change in the mood. For example, we've all heard that ex, um, expression, green with envy, right? Well, guess what? When people are in an extremely envious state, they begin to emanate a green color in their aura. That's where the expression came from. Or when someone says, well, he's yellow, you know, meaning that yellow is cowardly. Well, when people are afraid, they will emanate yellow in their aura. And then think about depictions in art. When you look at ancient Egyptian art, ancient Buddhist art, Christian art, where people have like a halo around them, guess what? That's an aura. People have been seeing auras since the dawn of human history, and that's why they're depicted in all the different cultures and arts, uh, art, art forms around the world. And certainly when you're grieving, your aura is going to change colors. Um, you know, when you're, when you're happy, it's going to look different. When you're sad, it's going to look different. So auras are not a static thing. They, they ebb and flow and shift and change. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I have something from uh, Helena who asks, Mark, is there any exercise one can do to help them make contact with their children? I know that you might have several, but maybe something specific that we could all do that would allow us to connect? Certainly. Prayer and meditation. Now, I know everybody's heard that. Prayer is when we talk to God. Meditation is when we listen. But the key of meditation is relaxation, to calm things down. So a lot of people expect, you know, they listen to a meditation uh, download or CD, that immediately they're going to start levitating things around the room. And that's not necessarily the case. But uh, quieting the mind. Think of your mind as like a blackboard. Um, or nowadays, a whiteboard with, you know, the, the Sharpies written all over it. And think of every impulse, feeling, um, emotion that you experience during a day written on the, the uh, blackboard. But well, by the end of the day, it looks like a pile of linguine, all right? And so what meditation does, it gets you a chance to erase the blackboard so you can focus on one thing. And that one thing may be um, becoming more receptive to the spirit of your child. One of the, the largest pitfalls that I see for people is they say, why doesn't he come to me? She never comes to me. He never comes to me. And because what's happening is without meaning to that I want, I want, I want is an energetic barrier. That angst, also um, people that are in a profound state of grief. That, that's why I recommend like when, when, uh, when somebody dies, wait four to six months after the reading. Spirits can communicate right away. 
but the, the person desiring the reading is so overcome with emotional pain and grief. I mean, what are you going to get out of the reading if you're hysterically crying during the entire session? Uh, you want to get to the point where your emotions stabilize so that then you can get the maximum benefit of the information coming through. And it's the same thing when you're trying to make contact with your child. If you're overcome with pain and desire to communicate with them inadvertently and unintentionally, you're creating a barrier. So what I recommend you do in your meditation and before you go to sleep, um, because uh, it, because uh, the sleep state is a very popular means the spirit is communicating. Instead of saying, I want this communication, change the energetic focus to, I welcome you to come to me. I invite you into my meditations. I invite you into my dreams. Do you see the difference? Okay, you're changing the focus from one of a desire to one of re receptivity. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, John asked a question and I wanted to see if you are familiar with this. Have you any news about the spirit radio? Um, that would be a very useful and interesting device if designers could actually get to work <laughs> or get one to work. Sorry. Well, my, my good friend, Dr. Gary Schwartz is uh, working on the soul phone project, um, which is essentially that. And I'm not at liberty. He brought me into his laboratory. Oh my God is all I can say. And I'm not at liberty to say what I saw, but it is conceivable that within our lifetime, there may be an apparatus capable of, of communicating with, uh, with the other side. Until then, the technology is us and the technology um, is mediums. And the thing is, we all have the same basic physiology. And from the science associated with spirit communication, it's believed that the pineal gland, which is at this, uh, all right, for those of you who do yoga, the third eye chakra right here. Well, if you go about four, four and a half, maybe five inches into your brain, there's a small gland about the size of a lima bean called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland regulates your brainwave frequencies, your, um, uh, your melatonin levels, your circadian rhythms, and your perception of light. Um, there have been studies, a joint a British uh, German study and a French Israeli study that discovered calcite and magnetite crystals inside of the pineal gland. And what was the first radio? A chunk of quartz crystal with a copper wire running low levels of electricity into it. Once again, electromagnetic energy. So essentially, we have a radio station in our head and the pineal gland regulates our brainwave frequencies. Right now, it, we're in the beta state. That's when you're awake. Then when you go to sleep, you go into alpha. And then when you go into a deeper sleep, you go into theta. It is on the alpha theta brainwave frequency border that psychic and mediumistic activity occurs because the brainwave frequency surges. Spirits see that, they bring their frequency down from the other side, bingo, you get a frequency match. So it's like tuning into a radio. We can all do this to some extent. Uh, I'm not one of these people that says, hey, take my course, be your own medium, because you're either a medium or you're not. Like I, like I can swim, okay, but I'm never gonna be Michael Phelps. I can play guitar. I will never be Eric Clapton, okay? That's just not gonna happen. So I can have the experience to an extent, but not to a greater extent. And that's okay because we're all good at different things. I've been studied in laboratories and Gary Schwartz being one of them. I was studied in LA and I was studied in the United Kingdom. And basically um, there's a different flow of electricity, if you will, through my brain. And also what it comes down to is that maybe I have an extra magnetite or calcite crystal in there. I mean, you, we, we simply aren't sure yet, but we do know that some people are, are much more proficient at spirit communication than others. Just like some people are better athletes than others, some better musicians, some better mathematicians. We're all, it, it would be boring, I guess, if we were all the same. It would be like a school of fish. You know? Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. And um, Diane said, or Diana says, what do you think of string theory whereby there are other scenarios going on whereby our child is not gone? 
Oh boy, yes, string theory, um, the multiverses, alternate universes. So there could be theoretically uh, an alternate universe where, and we see this a lot in science fiction, but the, the better science fiction programs and novels are based on science fact, like the, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and, and uh, people along those, authors along those lines. It's entirely possible. But string theory also ties into the fact that, okay, there's a universe and within a universe there are dimensions. And so sometimes we tend to use the terms dimension and uh, universe interchangeably when according to what quantum physicists have, have taught me is not necessarily the case. So yes, that is theoretically possible, but I think what we need to focus on is we are here in this universe and we are in the material world dimension and our loved ones are in what we can call the other side dimension. And we should focus on realizing that our relationship has gone from one of a physical nature to one of a spiritual nature and that we can um, communicate with them either through a medium or being receptive to them sending frequency beacons to us. That is so fascinating. I had never heard about the string theory, so that's I'm going to have to look into that a little bit more. Um, Carol is asking, what is hell? And some NDE claim that, they, that they've been there. Um, can you maybe elaborate on that? Yes. Um, actually, I give a whole lecture on, on the history of hell. Um, oh, goodness. Where do I begin? Okay. Hell is a myth and metaphor and quite real. Um, the first version of hell started 3,500 years ago in uh, Persia, which is now Iran, in the Zoroastrian religion that believes that the universe is one of dualism and there is an eternal struggle between light and dark, good and evil, you know, God and a negative entity, and that if you don't follow the teachings of that religion, then you end up in a fiery pit. Okay, so as the Persian Empire expanded throughout the Middle East, it began to influence other cultures. Meanwhile, in ancient Judea, um, which is modern day Israel, outside of Jerusalem, there is a valley known as Gehenna and in the Hinnom Valley. And in Gehenna, um, people who, who were criminals, dishonored, or couldn't afford a proper burial, their, their bodies were taken and they were thrown into lime pits, which were known as fire and brimstone. Isn't that interesting? And so while it was not part of the, officially part of the, the Judaism, it kind of became a thing that if you're bad, watch out because you're going to end up at Gehenna. Well, then the Romans come along and the Romans were very good at assimilating other cultures. And of course, they had the god Hades, who was the god of the underworld. And then as the empire shifted into Christianity, it incorporated this concept of Gehenna. Meanwhile, on the Roman Empire's northern border, they encountered the Germanic tribes and the Vikings. And the Vikings had the goddess of the underworld, and her name was Hel. And her father was Loki, the mischievous and evil god um, who, who struck down Baldur, the god of light, who was the son of the king of the gods. And Baldur died and his mother Freya went to hell and asked the goddess and he rose on the third day. And it's like, oh, that's interesting because that religion predated Christianity by at least a thousand years. So what you start seeing is this amalgamation in, in uh, the Roman Empire of all these different religions. And then in the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, where it said the Roman Empire is now Christian and that Jesus is God and will return. And until he does, I, Constantine, Emperor of the Romans, and God's vice regent on earth, and if you disobey the emperor and the laws of the empire, you'll be cast into an eternal pit of fire and brimstone. And so then the goddess hell became synonymous with the place, because originally when people said go to hell, what they meant was I want you to go to the afterlife. In other words, I wish you would die. And then Loki and Lucifer got, got transformed. And so then as time evolved, um, eight centuries ago, Dante's Inferno, um, that's how we think of hell now. It's presided over by this James Bond villain type that's Lucifer, the fallen angel who actually incorporated the Nordic god Loki's uh, habits. And uh, if you're bad, you go there. 
Okay, well, that's a myth, but it's also a metaphor um, that, that hell is here on earth. And for those of you who have lost a child, you are in hell. You are in a suffering, a relentless pain, a gnawing, burning um, anger and devastation. So in that sense, hell is very, very real. But it, it is not a stagnant, nor it, is it an eternal place, and it is something that you can eventually emerge from. Um, when it comes to a hellish NDE, there's a lot of discussion about that because in cases of anoxia and hypoxia, which is an oxygen um, deprived or starved brain, that tends to induce hallucinations of a very frightening nature. Although um, many people that have NDEs have neither hypoxia nor anoxia. So we gotta be careful with that one. Secondly, there's also a thought that first off, hell doesn't exist, but Remember I was talking about our higher self before being the librarian? So if you've had a lifetime where you've done some pretty despicable things and all of a sudden you have a near-death experience and your higher self is stepping in saying, here's your life review, you've been really negative and you get this wake-up call. So in the NDE, the near-death experience community, we're still open-minded about the hellish experiences, but it appears to be more of our higher self and possibly even God stepping in to say, you're going back, you're giving, getting a second chance, and this was your wake up call. I love it, I love it, thank you so much. I, um, there's a question from Irene, and I think this is a really pertinent question. Can you address those that refer to Bible passages, supposedly saying do not turn to mediums or seek our um, uh, our spirit, let's see, uh, our spirit economy in Leviticus. Yes. yes I'm very well Leviticus, aware of them. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. You can, you can take it from here. Okay. This is another one of my lectures. Um, yes, there are passages in the Bible that, that really come down on mediumship. Um, there's one of them in, uh, Leviticus that says, um, do not seek omens, uh, do not, Basically, um, don't eat raw meat and don't seek omens. And then there's one in Deuteronomy that says, do not sacrifice your child in a burning fire. And by the way, don't engage in witchcraft or talk to the dead. So apparently, you know, we're being equated with, you know, burning your child alive. However, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's another passage in 18 through, uh, verses 18 through 22, um, where it says that, the test for what a prophet, and that's what in the Old Testament um, psychics are referred to as, is a prophet. If, if, it, if what the prophet says is true, then it comes from God. And then one of my favorite passages is in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 4 through 12. It said that we all have gifts from God, and to one is the gift of prophecy, to another discernment of spirits. Okay, and that's talking to spirits. And then in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, it says that we all have gifts from God, and if your gift is one of prophecy, thou shalt prophesy. So you've got to take the Bible as a whole. Um, I saw something, I guess it's supposed to be a joke, but it said that if you buy a Bible and don't read it, you're a Catholic. If you buy a Bible and only read the passages you want to pass judgment on other people, you're an evangelical. If you buy a Bible and read the entire thing, you'll be an atheist. And, and I think that, you know, that that's rather facetious, but the problem is that people take a salad bar approach to Christianity. So they'll read the Bible and pick and choose the phrases they want to say mediums are bad and this and that, but there are plenty of other passages about psychic activity. Plus, think of all the psychic phenomena in the Bible where we're good guys, like Joseph, interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh. Okay, when Pharaoh was having the dream about the seven fat cows coming out of the Nile River to be devoured by the seven hungry, uh, the scrawny cows. And, and so the prisoner, Joseph, the Hebrew, who had the gift of discerning dreams, was brought before Pharaoh and said there'll be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Okay, well, Joseph is a superhero in the Bible. Then you've got Jacob's ladder, which very well could be a near-death experience. Um, then you have Saul and the Witch of Endor, and this is one of my favorites, okay, because 
this is where evangelicals uh, get into. See, you're not supposed to consult with the dead. Saul's favorite prophet, Samuel, and, and most trusted advisor had died, and things were going badly for him. David's popularity was on the rise. The Philistines were moving against him. So he went to the witch of Endor. She was a medium, and she brought forth the spirit of Samuel. And Samuel basically told Saul, that's it for you. Your time is at an end. Well, right after that, Samuel, I mean, uh, Saul is defeated in battle. His sons are killed. He takes his own life, and eventually David becomes the king of Judea. And so the rabbinical community in Judea said, see, see what happens when you talk to those people? That's what will happen to you. On the other hand, Jesus was a descendant of David through his mother Mary. So was it the will of God that Saul's time came and went and he had to go, even though he died by suicide, so that um, several generations, it was like um, almost 28 generations later, Jesus is born of his mother Mary of the house of David. So it depends on how you look at it. It's a matter of interpretation. And the prophet, the, the spirit of the prophet Samuel didn't make this happen to Saul, nor did the witch of Endor. Perhaps this was the will of God, and basically Saul just got the heads up. Thank you. This is always something that people are questioning. So it's, it's wonderful for you to be able to kind of uh, uh, put that into perspective. Um, uh, Diana asks, is deja vu sort of when we skip a track to another dimension? It is. Um, deja vu, um, the earlier question about string theory, um, that, that ties into this as well. It also ties into space-time. On the other side, there's no time as we know it. Everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen is occurring simultaneously. Um, and see, once again, we think that we're born and that time moves in a linear fashion where it actually doesn't. And so with deja vu, you're tapping into that space-time frequency and you're picking up on an event that for you and I would be considered the future, but gee, this already happened to me or I felt that it did. So um, once again, we got back to quantum physics. And I really like what Nikola Tesla said. He's one of my favorite people, even though uh, he was, um, how many people here have seen the Big Bang Theory? You see the TV? Okay, Big Bang. You know, they modeled Sheldon after Nikola Tesla. Um, yeah, because Tesla was tall and skinny. He was insufferable to be, insufferable to be around. And you know, Sheldon always knocks on the door, da -da -da Leonard, da -da -da Leonard, you know, three times. Well, Tesla wouldn't stay, wouldn't enter a building unless he walked around it three times. And he wouldn't stay in a hotel room unless the hotel room's number was divisible by three. And he was this incredible um, genius who came up with alternating current he worked for Thomas Edison for less than a year, came up with some of Edison's greatest discoveries, but irritated Edison so much he had to get rid of him. But uh, at any rate, te what Tesla said is that what one person calls the laws of physics, another calls God. Very interesting. Um, uh, let's see, we have Katie who uh, wrote, do you feel some are thrown into mediumship never having experienced it till a trauma brought it on. Um, uh, some are born with it, but don't even realize it until the trauma. Do you think that it's the trauma or maybe just the fact that we're born with it? Yes, I, I think that uh, they already had the ability. It was probably there, but they were filtering it out. And then the trauma flips the switch on. Deb says, do you think after someone dies that they may not cross over right away because they are confused from a sudden death. No, no. Um, and, and once again, this is where I, I disagree uh, and depart with a lot of my colleagues. I don't buy this. They're wandering the world like Ichabod Crane holding a severed head and all that. That's, <sighs> that's nonsense. We are pure energy. And the second the hard drive, okay, think your brain is a, hard, a computer hard drive, and as soon as that hard drive crashes, that energy gets uploaded to the other side. So 
because I've communicated with spirits um, the second, um, uh, within seconds after, after them dying. Um, that, that, that's, yeah, that's part of my talk on shared death experiences, but um, no, uh, it doesn't matter if you're traumatically, if you die traumatically or on, on drugs, as soon as you're out of the body, you are a, an immortal living spirit, fully aware and tied into then the collective consciousness the eternal sea of souls. There are so many. I, I have to say there are 51 messages that I'm trying to get through here. I, there are so many people who want to talk to you. This is very exciting. Um, let's try one from Patricia. I went to a spiritual meeting that I hadn't been to in a while. And at the end, I was given a group energy healing. They all know about Melissa. Um, one woman who is highly intuitive said when it ended that Melissa was speaking. She went on to give me a very healing message at the end of it. Uh, that, and Melissa said that part of her soul had, has reincarnated as a walk-in. The person is older and has long, I think, dark hair, and I will know it's her by her eyes. I may have an idea if not two, of who it might even be. What exactly is a walk-in and is this possible? <laughs> no, it's nonsense. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, it's, this is that ooky wookie Victorian. It's like those physical mediums that sit in the dark and make slurping sounds and say that it's echoplasm and, and they have to blast rock and roll between, uh, you know, whatever. Um, that's a bunch of leftover Victorian era nonsense. God's gift to us is our uniqueness and our individuality. And when we leave, we leave. Okay. Um, although we're energetically connected to our loved ones here and to the higher um, aspects of our higher self and to the collective consciousness. But see, that's my work. Um, Evidence Maturity, Never Letting Go, my new book coming out is to let go of this Victorian era nonsense and this primitive superstition and redefine mediumship in 21st century terms based on science, quantum physics, human physiology, evidence, and of course, faith. Well, I have a bunch of people saying that you would be a fabulous dinner guest. You would be able to talk about everything, that you have an entire lecture series, uh, one of which is on reincarnation, um, that you're awesome. I love you, I love you, Mark Anthony. Um, so there are a bunch of those. I'm looking through them to find, um, okay. Um, oh, Lindsay is saying, Mark, you are very knowledgeable, curious. How did you not know your mom transitioned? I kind of did. I kind of did, and I'll tell you why. It's just painful for me to talk about. I don't talk about it very much. That day that, that she hugged me and she said, thank you for being my son. Something went through me when she said that to me. And I'll never forget when I left her house and when the door closed, it was like, <clears throat> it was weird. It was like the shockwave went through me. And the next morning when I got up to go to court, I remember that morning, I didn't feel right. I go, this is going to be a very long day. This is going to be a very difficult day. You know, and, and I had to be in court because I had two clients in front of the same judge and it's, it was a rather cantankerous and difficult judge. So I was really focused on that, but I realized something wasn't right. You know, it was, I, I guess putting it in Obi-Wan Kenobi terms, there was a great disruption in the force and, and I knew it. Um, and then, and then, when I got to court and, and they, they had to pull me out of court to tell me what had happened, um, then, I, then I realized what I was feeling. It, people also have to, to understand that being a psychic, being a psychic medium, it does not by any stretch make me all knowing and all seeing. Um, it gives me insights, intuition, it makes me sensitive to frequency. Um, God is all knowing and all seeing. Okay, I, I have uh, this ability that, that I do my best to, to help people through telephone readings and through 
through events like this and the public events that, that we will be doing um, once this, this pandemic passes. But, you know, uh, I remember when I was on, on TV, they, uh, on the doctors, they were asking me about this. And I said, well, I'm a medium, I'm not the Messiah. You know, so, so being psychic gives me insights into, into things, but it doesn't make me all knowing and all seeing. And now I know from communicating with my mom's spirit, she died, she got up that morning and she put on a pot of coffee and she laid down on the couch in her living room, went to sleep and died. And she had what was known as a ventricular fibrillation where the electrical field in your heart begins to give out. And realistically, if we all get to go that way, that, that's the, the way you want to go because it's painless. And, um, and she earned that death because she'd been plagued by a lot of very serious health issues throughout her life. But the thing is, she needed to die alone and in peace. And I remember about a month before, she was talking about when I die, I don't want it to be in a hospital with a bunch of tubes in my nose and people staring at me in IVs. She said, I've been through enough of that in my life. She says, when I go, I want it to be peaceful and by myself. And mom being mom, I think she already knew that. That's beautiful. And uh, Kelly is saying, can we find out more about this research you were talking about? Is this on your website? As a researcher, this fascinates me. Uh, if Kelly, which research in particular? Well, I know you do a lot of research. Kelly, are you available to maybe type in what you would like for him to talk more about? Um, well, well, here's what I can say. A lot of the things that I'm talking about are in my books, Never Letting Go and Evidence Fraternity. And if people want to find out about my books, and they're both on audio now, they're in several different languages, please go to my website, evidenceofeternity.com. You can also book a phone reading with me, which are just as accurate as in-person readings. And, and phone readings are possible, once again, because of quantum physics. Spirits, being pure energy, move at the speed of light. And, you know, um, here's a question a lot of people ask is, well, are they with me all the time? Well, the thing is, they're moving at the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second. So by the time it took me to say that, your daughters could have been to the moon and back about four times, okay? So they don't have to be with us all the time because, you know, we get up and we're like, uh, you know, we're moving all slow. They zip in, see what we're doing, pop out, go do whatever it is that they're doing, go visit other people, um, connect with the collective consciousness. They, they evolve, they grow, um, they, they acquire information, and then they pop back. And by that time, we finally stepped out of bed. <laughs> so, so they're not like anchored to us because a lot of people are like, well, is my grieving keeping them here? It's like, well, for a couple of nanoseconds. So, so don't worry about that. And, and grieving is a part of life. Um, crying is the healthy thing to do. And, and uh, it's one of the things I, I like to, to teach my fellow men. Women are much better about expressing their emotions and their grief than men are because we've been socialized to contain it. Like, you know, we'd rather fry than cry. But studies at um, USC, University of Southern California, and in, um, in a hospital in Minnesota, not the Mayo Clinic, but another research institute, I found out that the tears of grief, which are different than reflex tears, you know, like from pollen or, or uh, uh, dicing onions, something like that, but tears of grief actually contain the neurotransmitters that cause depression. So that's why, you know, when you get all overcome with grief and you have that, that outburst, that, that intense crying, you feel a little bit better afterwards because actually you're getting out of your body the chemicals that cause depression. So the healthy thing to do is cry. Thank you. And I have, I, I have a, so many questions, but we only have a, a limited amount of time. One of them I think is a, good, is a good question for all of us. John asks, what are your feelings on the length and damage of this pandemic? I think we're all kind of uh, wanting to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, we're, um, we're talking to um, uh, Rocky, uh, my manager, is talking to Coast to Coast AM radio about having me on to talk about um, the various um, uh, theories about that. This 
this pandemic is a terrible thing in many ways, as we all know, and it's changing a lot of things. But for the first time in human history, all of our scientists, all of our medical experts are actually working together for a common purpose. I mean, no matter what you may think of the president, he said, we're going to send ventilators to China, to Russia, to wherever they are needed. Uh, Vietnam just sent the United States a bunch of face masks. We are, China sent a bunch of uh, medical supplies to Italy. We're seeing the whole world working together. In a sense, it's almost like this karmic shockwave going through the world that's saying, see, if you put all of your intelligentsia, your scientists, your medical experts working for common purpose and stop trying to destroy yourselves, you can solve all of your problems. So yes, this is a terrible thing. I, it sickens me to no end to see um, how many people like in New York City, every time I hear 780 something people died in one day, it, it's, it's just heart wrenching. But when this is over, this is giving us an opportunity to change things. The problem is there's too many greedy, narcissistic, power hungry egotists uh, that are the ones that are making the decisions. Because I think around the world, people are, I mean, I've traveled all over the world. I've been in the Amazon, Southeast Asia, Central America, all over Europe. I mean, you know, many, many places. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the people want a job. They want to live in a decent neighborhood. They want their children to feel loved and they want to come home at night to someone that loves them. They don't want to kill and, and they don't want destruction. I remember something Golda Meir said, she was the, um, the prime minister of Israel. Um, somebody asked her, said, well, do you ever think there'll be peace between Israel and your Arab neighbors? And she said, there will be peace when our en enemies realize that they love their children more than they hate us. And I think we are actually seeing this now that we really do care about each other as a human race. The question is, when this is over, will we have learned that lesson? That's beautiful. And I'm hoping that we're all going to become much more compassionate, caring people and take care of each other more than we did before. But I, I love that answer. Um, I just have to read this from Eileen. Uh, she says, I am a scientist, a psychologist, and I love how you are presenting such profound information with historical background and explanations, especially biblical interpretation. The dinosaurs on your bookshelf look exactly like the ones I had as a kid in the 60s from the vending machines that money was put into and it poured out in this, plast uh, this plastic into a mold. <clears throat> I remember getting them in Florida when I was seven years old. Just an interesting aside, bless you for all you have said. And I, I don't know if Rocky is able to go through here and read all of the compliments. Um, there are a lot of other questions. Um, I, I guess one thing that I really would like for people to know because I see a lot of questions like this and just wind up with this is what it's like for our kids on the other side. Could you, you just give a little information about what it's like over there? Yeah, um, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, every so often, a spirit will let me feel what it's like to be them. And if I could bottle this feeling and sell it, I'd put every drug dealer in the world out of business like that. It, it's it's amazing. It's all of a sudden you feel I, I feel like I'm or you uh, I feel like I'm part of everything everywhere and my body has no substance. It's like if you're like in a, in the ocean or in a pool and you go underwater and that water's that perfect temperature and in and, and you're just like spread out and you can't even feel your body. You feel like weightless and there's this overwhelming sense of joy and euphoria interconnectedness, this vast knowledge. And the thing is, when they do this to me, I can handle it for maybe five seconds because it's like being a single wire and all of a sudden all the electricity that goes through Manhattan goes right through me. And I'm always thankful that they, they seem to know that 
and they do it at the end of the reading because after that I am like, <laughs> I am spent. If they did it at the beginning of the reading, it'd be a short reading. But, but the thing is, um, that is because my finite human brain, which houses my infinite um, soul, is designed for material world, finite, limited perceptions so that we can experience things here that we cannot on the other side. So your kids are doing just fine. We're the ones that are suffering. We're the ones that are living in hell. Hell is not some realm, uh, some mystical realm presided over by some Viking God. It is here in the material world. Hell is alive and well. And all of you parents who've lost a child, nobody needs to tell you that. One last thing. Uh, oops, can you hear me? Um, Deb Johnson to, uh, just said to everyone, my daughter with disabilities is in IVU with COVID-19. I hope my son in spirit is with her. Um, I, I, I just want to send out love and healing to Deb. Um, I know that this is affecting so many people all over the world right now. But I am 100% sure that her son is with her daughter and taking good care of her. Um, Absolutely. Can, can we close with a prayer? Yes. Yes, um, definitely. Is, um, oh, God, send forth your healing energy upon these people. Guide all our thoughts and words so that our whole lives will be positive. Stay with us in times of trial. Be close when we are weak in body and soul and grant us the strength, courage, and grace to take yet another step through our journey of grief. Be at peace. Namaste. Amen. Aho. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. I, um, we have two more people waiting to join you again. The, 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 we had so many people here. We're going to be putting this on YouTube for anyone who joined us after, <clears throat> after Mark started. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll be able to see this on YouTube um, as well as on Helping Parents Heal. I truly appreciate this. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be able to speak to us. And um, I hope that we'll be able to do this again next year, same time, same station, but at the conference. And that would be wonderful with you up on stage. That would just be so exciting. Well, I look forward to it. And you know, um, look at this, what we're going through with the COVID-19 um, crisis. We can look at it as this is terrible and it's really irritating and I hate it, or it can give us the time to focus on things that we always seem to put off also focus on your meditation, focus on yourselves. And in 1665, the Great Plague swept through uh, Great Britain and Sir Isaac Newton self-quarantined. And while he was in isolation during quarantine, he invented calculus, he invented the laws of gravity, and he invented the laws of optics. So, <laughs> <laughs> This is the time to work on that. Um, we've got to get to work. So I know that Irene also wants to say goodbye. And then we're going to have everyone else unmute themselves so that they can all say thank you and goodbye to you. Yes, thank you so much. It was just a fabulous meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 you. Thank Thank you. 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 Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Marco Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a, such a great meeting. Thanks, Mark. Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Be safe. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Anna. Oh, I'm so glad to see you as well as. Oh, my goodness. What a great night. Yes, it was. Thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. It was wonderful. really great. Very uplifting. So yes. much information. Just fabulous. That was. How many people were on? <laughs>